everyone. We're going to begin before we have our parade with a responsive reading. Next slide. Wave high your palm branches. The Lord of life approaches. Sing with great joy, for the Savior has come. Even the beast of burden on which he rides seems to be royal. All creation shouts praises to the King of kings. Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna. Now we'll sing Hosanna. Good morning, everyone. Isn't this sanctuary beautiful? Our chancel guild is outdoing themselves. So good morning. I'm Stacy Mortson, student minister for another month or so. <laughs> uh, how many days, Joanne? 57 days here at Trinity Centennial at Rosemont. Welcome to worship, whether you're joining us here in the sanctuary this morning or watching from home later today. In person or in cyberspace, you are a part of this beloved community. This is your advance notice of an official board meeting taking place April the 16th. So we have to have two weeks notice. So this is your first notice, so prepare for an official board meeting after church on April the 16th. So today is the sixth Sunday of Lent, the beginning of Holy Week. We call it Palm Passion Sunday as two major parts of the Holy Week drama are addressed. The first is Jesus' triumphal entry to Jerusalem for the celebration of the feast of the Passover. The second is the reading of the Passion narrative which includes events leading up to Jesus' arrest, trial, and crucifixion that need to be heard before Good Friday. You may recall growing up, Palm Sunday was just Palm Sunday, and it was all about the palms. So this shift in liturgical practice has been recently uh, changed. It's recent, relatively recent, about 1992, it changed to Palm Passion. So we begin today with the liturgy of the palms. 
So take a deep breath. Exhale and prepare to meet the Holy One in this time of worship today. And we'll do our tenebrae. Crowds of people line streets to welcome Jesus from Nazareth, riding into town on a donkey. On the other side of Jerusalem, some others went to see a proper Roman military parade. They watched Pontius Pilate riding on a war horse, accompanied by battle-hardened foot soldiers with their swords, shields, helmets, and war drums. They were the enemy. They were impressive and fearful. At Jesus' parade, the people were shouting, Hosanna, save us, we pray. Save us from the tyranny of the Romans who rule over us. Save us so that we may live in peace. Save us so that we can live with our dignity. Save us so that we can live as ones created in God's image. We shout, we pray, and we wait. When will the day of God, the kingdom of God, come? Let's pray together. O oh God, who rules over the universe, please do not let the fools of this world destroy your world. Do not let them gloat over you and to us. Do not let them have the last say or the last laugh. May your will be done. May justice and peace prevail. May we truly know that we live and move and have our being in you and through you. So we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And as is our custom, we'll acknowledge the land on which we worship. We acknowledge this sanctuary is located on the treaty lands and traditional territory of the Anishinaabe peoples, including the Adawa, the Ojibwa, and the Potawatomi nations known together as the Three Fires Confederacy. Rosemont is covered by the Lake Simcoe Nottawasaga Treaty Number 18, signed in 1818 with the Chippewa Nation. This area is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. We acknowledge that we are all treaty people, settler and indigenous alike, and accept our responsibility to honor all our relations while praying that we may move forward in the spirit of relationship, reconciliation, and respect for all. The way has been prepared. For the crowds, it is the way of celebration. For Jesus, it is the way of completion. Amid shouts and waving palms, branches. He comes into the holy city. Open your hearts this day to receive the Savior. We open wide our hearts and spirits to receive Jesus the Christ. Come, let us worship. And we'll pray together. Hosanna, Savior. We wave our palms and sing our praise as we remember your triumphal entry into Jerusalem. May your spirit enter the heart of our worship this day, giving us the strength to endure the journey which is ahead. Amen. And so in the spirit of parade, I want you to imagine you're in New Orleans and watching the bands come down the street as the bells play, Oh, When the Saints.
On Palm Sunday, we celebrate what is often called Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. I think we easily imagined the focus of the whole city was on Jesus and that they knew what they were celebrating. But the reality is that possibly millions of pilgrims were flooding into, into Jerusalem for the Passover, and Jesus was probably not the center of attention. It was his small band of followers who, in excited anticipation, imagined they were part of a royal procession, and that Jesus would become king. Jesus let them treat him as royalty, even as he arrived on a donkey. But deep in his heart, he knew that this was also a funeral procession, a walk down death road, so to speak. After each sentence, when I say, yet, I invite you all to respond with, he kept on walking. Jesus knew that every step he took was one step closer to his death. Yet, he kept on walking. He knew that before he died, he would have to confront the center of religious power, those who used God's name to manipulate and control and oppress. Yet, he kept on walking. He knew that he would be betrayed by one of his friends and companions on the road. Yet, he kept on walking. He knew that he would probably be falsely tried by a corrupt and unjust legal system. Yet, he kept on walking. He knew the crowds were fickle and likely to turn on him as they had the prophets before him. Yet, he kept on walking. He knew he would be mocked and humiliated. Yet, he kept on walking. He knew his dearest and closest friends would fail him, abandon him, deny him, and struggle to believe in him. Yet, he kept on walking. He knew he would be flogged and tortured, almost beyond what he could physically bear. And yet, he kept on walking. He knew his mother's heart and the hearts of the men and women who loved him would be broken. Yet, he kept on walking. He knew he would suffer an agonizing death and face the greatest confusion and pain he had ever known. Yet, he kept on walking. He knew that if he was faithful to the end, he would know the greatest joy of bringing a glimpse of the kingdom to the world. Yet, he kept on walking. He knew that when all of it was through, he would return to the one from whom he came, the one who is perfect. And yet, he kept on walking. And we who remember him in his last days keep on walking with him. So we'll sing our prayer of illumination, Listen, God is Calling, and then we'll have our first reader of many of the Palm and Passion liturgies for today. That will be Joanne. So listen. The first reading today is Matthew 21, 1 to 11, the Liturgy of the Palms, Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, the Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet. Tell the daughter of Zion, look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of the donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, 
and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he entered, entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. And you can stand in body or in spirit to sing, He Came Riding on a Donkey. You may be seated, and now we move from the liturgy of the Psalms into the liturgy of the Passion with Jane. Good 
Good morning. morning. Second reading is Matthew 27, 1 to 2, and 11 to 26. When the morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people conferred together against Jesus in order to bring about his death. They bound him, led him away, and handed him over to, to Pilate, the governor. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You say so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he did not answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many accusations they make against you? But he gave him no answer, not even a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the festival, the governor was accustomed to release a prisoner for the crowd, anyone whom they wanted. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Jesus Barbarous. So after they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Jesus, Barbarous, or Jesus, who is called the Messiah? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that they had handed him over. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that innocent man. For today I have suffered a great deal because of a dream about him. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barbarus and to have Jesus killed. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barbarus. Pilate said to them, Then what should I do with Jesus, who is called the Messiah? All of them said, Let him be crucified. Then he asked, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he could do nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took some water, washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. Then the people as a whole answered, His blood be on us and on our children. So he released Barbarus for them, and after the flogging, Jesus, he handed him over to the cru- to be crucified. Sorry for the interruption in this morning's proceedings, folks, but I need to clarify a few things. There's always another point of view, right? Things got so out of hand, but I actually think my husband and Jesus could have been friends under other circumstances. They were about the same age. Both of them were passionate, committed, and opinionated, and intelligent too, except they thought so differently. You see, Jesus was a Jew, and Pontius, of course, was a Roman. He never understood the Jews, and that drove him almost to distraction. You can't get a clear answer out of them about anything, he would fume. Ask them a straight, logical question, and they tell you some old story. Pilate wanted so badly to make a success of governing Judea. He knew perfectly well he only got the job because he married me, the granddaughter of Caesar Augustus himself, and he was always trying to prove himself. But right from the start, his career went sour. Pilate had a showdown with the Jewish leaders over Caesar's image in the temple area or something like that. It was a foolish squabble, and Pilate knew it. But I've got to show them that I'm strong and resolute, Claudia, he said to me. If I just show a hint of weakness, if I back down even an inch, That snake of a high priest, that Caiaphas, he will take any slight advantage that I give him. Judea was a complicated, no-win situation for Pontius. And then this Jesus business broke out, and Pilate couldn't win this one. I knew it. I even had dreams about it. Don't get involved with this Jesus, Pontius, I warned him, no matter what you do you will lose. I'll do what is necessary, Claudia, 
Pontius said in his official voice, revealing he was actually quite frightened. I will interview the prisoner and judge him according to our Roman justice. He will be treated fairly. I know that, Pilate, but that's not the game with these Judeans. I'll decide what the game is, Claudia, he said. And there the conversation ended. The Judeans brought the prisoner up to the praetorium. Pilate met them outside so they wouldn't have to contaminate themselves or whatever is supposed to happen when they set foot inside a Roman building. He interviewed Jesus right there in front of them. Look, he said finally, the guy is a little crazy and yes, a troublemaker, but he hasn't done anything to deserve execution. I mean, I can't have him killed just because you people don't like him. What I will do is have him flogged. Well, you should have heard the hullabaloo. We want him dead, they yelled. Crucify him. Now listen, Pilate had integrity. He wasn't about to execute a man unless a crime had been committed. And blasphemy is not a crime under Roman law. But Pilate was no fool either. He knew that this was all about political maneuvering and charges and counter charges, so confusing. I was pacing the halls for most of it, fighting off a migraine. But I can't forget what happened next. Pilate dragged this Jesus up into our quarters so he could talk privately with him, away from all the yelling and screaming. I was walking the corridors when I stopped just outside Pilate's office, listening. And that's when it struck me just how alike they were, yet so different. Two men of talent and integrity, speaking to each other across such vastly different realities. Pontius really wanted to do the right thing. Look, he said to Jesus, give me something that'll satisfy the mob, something that I can put in my report to Rome so I don't have to have you killed. Jesus looked right back at Pilate, right through him, but he said nothing. Pilate snapped. Look, I have the power of life and death over you. I can send you out to be torn apart by that mob, or I can save your hide. You have no real power over me, said Jesus. No power that really counts. You and I are caught in this evil drama. You have your role to play and I have mine. What is your role, asked Pontius, except to satisfy the bloodlust of that mob? I am called to live the truth, said Jesus. What is truth? Pilate asked him quietly. Jesus looked at him intently and yes, even compassionately, but he said nothing. Both men knew, I think, that Jesus could not reply in any way that Pilate could comprehend, and nor would Jesus have understood had Pilate defined his kind of truth for him. The conversation stopped. There was nothing left to say. Jesus would die. And Pilate would spend the rest of his life rehearsing that conversation. Why couldn't he just explain things to me? Logically and rationally, Pilate asked over and over again. Those Jews, you ask them a question, and they tell you a story. I too have rehearsed that conversation, and I wonder if Pontius and this Jesus, if they had met in another way, could they have learned to like each other? If they just had a chance to talk? Pilate, the logical lawman, might have discovered the poetic dreamer deep inside himself. And Jesus, the dreamer, might have shown to Pilate the logic on which his dream of this kingdom was built. There could have been respect, and perhaps they could have seen themselves as brothers, but it's too late. And now Peyton will continue the Passion readings.
Good morning. Uh, this reading comes from Matthew chapter 27, verses 27 to 54. The soldiers mocked Jesus. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole cohort around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on his head. They put a reed in his right hand and knelt before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. After mocking him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they came upon a man from Cyrene named Simon. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink, mixed with gall, but when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his clothes among themselves by casting lots. Then they sat down there and kept watch over him. Over his head they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down from the cross now, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he wants to, for he said, I am God's son. The rebels who were crucified with him also taunted him in the same way. From noon on, darkness came over the whole land, until three in the afternoon. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lima sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, This man is calling for Elijah. At once one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. Then Jesus cried again with a loud voice and breathed his last. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. After his resurrection, they came out of the tombs and entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now when the centurion and those with him, who were keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were terrified and said, Truly this man was God's son. This is the word of God. Now we'll sing our next hymn, Jesus Keep Me Near the Cross.
be seated. The palm branches we wave are symbols of all we have to celebrate as we welcome Jesus, God's just and loving one, to Jerusalem. Our gifts of time and talents are symbols of our renewed faithfulness as we continue Jesus' mission of justice and caring in our world. Our offerings will be received. Let's pray together. Holy One, we know that these gifts alone cannot heal the pain of poverty. There is also spiritual poverty to be overcome, a change in people's minds and systems of power. We pray that these funds are used wisely to embolden discipleship in our community, lead us to appearing justice, with a deepened sense of spirituality. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And as we begin to pray, let's sing. Lord, listen to your children. When I think of Jesus and his way of the cross, I believe that with each step, he was identifying more and more deeply with us, with all of us, especially the most broken parts of ourselves and our communities. He was identifying with all the pain and suffering and despair of a really messed up, broken, lost world. He was identifying with the oppressed and the downtrodden, those whom the world has deemed last and least. And he invites us to pick up our cross and follow. He invites us to walk in solidarity with others who are forced to walk a path of suffering, humiliation, and death. He invites us to know our weaknesses and brokenness and not be afraid to keep walking. In our prayers, we'll reflect on some of the people we have grown to love the people whose plight has found a place in our hearts and in our prayers. And we will imagine them walking this way of the cross in the company of Jesus and with the spirit of Jesus. And let's imagine ourselves companioning them with different levels of understanding perhaps, but with growing solidarity. For each of these groups, I will pray, keep walking, keep walking. And then I invite you to respond, if you like, in the spirit of Christ, keep walking. Let's practice that. Keep walking, keep walking. In the spirit of Christ, keep walking. And at a moment that feels right to you, I encourage you to join the motley band accompanying Jesus and keep walking. Feel free to make walking sounds with your hands or your feet. To keep walking. So let's pray. Ah, holy Jesus, who walked with the young and strong on Palestinian roads, we see our young people walking the way of the cross. Too many live with little or no hope for tomorrow. The pressures they face are great and they feel alone. Give them courage, as you had, to keep walking. Keep walking. In the spirit of Christ, keep walking. We see our elders walking the way of the cross 
often disconnected from family and friends by distance or by circumstance, faced with health issues, financial distress, and other concerns. Worried for children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, assure them of your presence as they keep walking, keep walking in the spirit of Christ, keep walking. God, who is mother and father to us all, we see parents and other adults walking the way of the cross, struggling to make a living, to educate their children, to keep them safe. They are born weary, bone weary <laughs> from the effort. Empower them to keep walking, keep walking in the spirit of Christ, keep walking. Jesus, whose own family fled Israel for safe haven, we see refugees and those seeking asylum, walking the way of the cross, treated as criminals or less than human, without place or protection or provision. Heal their hearts. Help them keep walking, keep walking in the spirit of Christ, keep walking. You who taught us to love our neighbor, we see neighbors battling isolation and depression, walking the way of the cross, carrying the cross of addiction, mental illness, broken relationships, and lack of hope for a change. Be with them as they keep walking, keep walking in the spirit of Christ, keep walking. God of the Bible who guides us, we see those walking aimlessly, lost, without knowledge of God or where their path is ultimately heading, spiritually disconnected, wondering where God is in the midst, unaware that Jesus walks with them. Help them know he will continue to help them keep walking, keep walking in the spirit of Christ, keep walking. Great physician, we see people living with disability, so vulnerable sometimes, and yet amazingly resilient. We see them making their way in chairs, with canes, with walkers, and with hearing aids and medication. Strengthen them on their way as they keep walking, keep walking. In the spirit of Christ, keep walking. Rainbow God of great diversity, we see ourselves in all our messy mix of beauty and brokenness, courage and fear, insight and delusions, love and apathy. With all our different personalities and creativity and struggle and passion, regardless of our color, our tongue, our gender, our age, sexuality or nationhood, encourage us in justice and in peace to keep walking, keep walking. In the spirit of Christ, keep walking. Holy One, we walk through the broken palm branches, the hosannas of the crowd still ringing in our ears. We walk toward the upper room to that last meal and all that lies beyond. We walk from celebration to reflection and from dedication to defection. Be with us, Lord, as we keep walking, keep walking. In the spirit of Christ, keep walking. God of Lenten journeying, hear us as we pray. There is so much weighing on our hearts, dear Lord. And now we bring you the cares and concerns most important for each of us into this sacred time of prayerful silence. God, who keeps walking, who keeps walking with us. Receive these prayers and the prayers of our hearts in the name of the one who came to teach us how to pray together. Jesus Christ, our Lord, in his words, our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, before we sing our, our uh, last hymn, I just want to invite everyone downstairs for coffee afterwards. And also to remind you, there will be a Good Friday service here on Friday at 1030. And now we'll sing Shadows Gather Deep and Cold as we head into our Holy Week, number 134. My friends, we hope that your time of worship today has been a blessing to you, as certainly your presence here in the sanctuary or online has been a blessing to us. As you go inspired, encouraged, and transformed into your Holy Week, may the God of Lenten journeys walk with you. May the Christ of loving kindness show you the way, and may the delightful Holy Spirit sustain you and guide you always. Go in peace now. Instead of a going out hymn, I ask you to be seated if you would. And we're going to think about Jesus having that last moment of prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane as the bell choir plays Sweet Hour of Prayer. <laughs> <laughs> 